Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Jeff Poole. And I'm Joe Lalo. And we've got a cool return guest for you this week. Those of you who have been listening faithfully for a couple of years may remember Gail Carriger from uh, March of 2017. Uh, and as a reminder for those who do not remember, she is a writer of comedies of manners mixed with urban fantasy and also the sexy San Andreas Shifter series written as G.L. Carriger. Her regular books include the Parasol Protectorate and Finishing School series. She's published in many languages and has over a dozen New York Times bestsellers. She was once an archaeologist and is fond of shoes, octopuses, and tea. And welcome back to the show, Gail. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for having me back. This is great. So uh, I seem to be on a two-year rotation then, right? About this time, two years ago. Seems good. Yeah, we like to, well, you've been doing some new stuff, you know, and I saw you had the, the pen name out. So do you want to kind of update us on what you've been doing lately? Sure. Um, this is, I listen to you guys regularly and I'm like, this is my least favorite part of the show is when the author is like shelling their crap. But uh, so I, I, but the interesting bit is that I did launch a pen name and, uh, but it's like a married pen, pen name. So the last name is exactly the same. And, uh, and all of, most of my fans know that it's a pen name. So I'm using the pen name strategically just to tell people that there's a higher sexiness and some swear words in, in some of the other stuff. So they, they can kind of pick and choose. That's more why I did the pen name. And that's just because I wanted to write it. I've been, uh, I read a lot of romance and I was like, I'm going to try some romance for a change. Um, I always have romantic stuff in my books, but this is just more explicit. So yeah, that was the big thing. And then I, um, I kind of pivoted. I used to be, obviously, with New York Times, I used to be mostly traditional. And these days I am mostly hybrid. So that's, uh, um, and uh, most of my income is coming from independent projects and self-publishing. So that's been fun. It's been an interesting year. <laughs> Well, that's good. Are you still publishing some books with your publisher or are you all? Yep. <laughs> no, I'm still there. Um, I owed them a couple books. So that's still, that's part of it. And I also write young adults and I do feel um, like the struggle to get young adult to the market is, is still real from the self-publishing perspective. So um, if they, I have a new um, series on proposal, and if they take that, then I will be continuing traditional as well. Um, but it is mostly these days I'm kind of cast my eye at YA when I'm when I'm thinking about trad. Yeah, they do seem to have an easier time uh, with all those folks who just want the paperback versions. Uh, I don't know. That's the age where it's still cool to fill your bookshelves. You haven't had to move five times and <laughs> get cranky packing everything. I guess. It's also, I mean, the great secret of, of the YA market or children's market in general is that your primary customer are schools and libraries, not actually kids. Um, the kids are kind of secondary. And then, and parents, of course, right? So, um, and that, there's still a pretty, I think, uh, gate, there's still a gateway in place for that, that aspect of the, the YA industry. It seems like every time we have someone on the show that's doing well self-publishing YA, it comes out that their all their audience is like 30s and 40s, and <laughs> maybe they're giving some of them to their their kids, but they just happen to be reading that age group themselves. And and that's the, that's not to be discounted. I do do think there is a huge readership for YA. Actually, I was just talking about this uh, in adults, but. Um, I was just talking about this with my romance chapter because we were thinking um, it's almost like YA. So romance has something called sweet romance, which tends to be like close the bedroom door and fade to black and it's, it's not explicit at all. And I feel like YA is kind of the sweet romance for the science fiction and fantasy world. It's, it's just like you kind of, you know, it, it's got di different sets of tropes are in place. It's dif different lengths are in place. And so I kind of wonder if, um, there's a certain uh, certain thing that that reader base is looking for as adults that attracts them to YA within the sci-fi fantasy field. So there definitely is an audience for it. I'm not saying that. I just feel like um, the struggle is a little bit harder still in in self-publishing to kind of carve your your space. Although I'm very interested in and paying attention to people who are doing like serialization stuff in in the YA world. Um, so who knows, maybe, maybe I'll go that direction in the future. But right now I'm, I'm still thinking, tried for that. 
Yeah, well, I mean, why not? You know, if you can have the best of both worlds, why say go for it as long as the <laughs> contracts and everything are agreeable to you. Yeah, exactly. Well, you kind of hinted that you started the, the shifters because you just enjoy some romance. Uh, how has that been going? Has it been a different, it's a slightly different subgenre for you and uh, a new name, even if you let everybody know about it. <laughs> yeah. What, what was it like launching a, a new series? It was, well, at first it was pretty nerve wracking because I wasn't sure if my reader base would follow me. I mean, um, so my my universe is is peopled with a lot of queer characters and kind of very open in, in that arena. Um, and I have finally like grandfathered uh, traditional into allowing me to have like a lesbian main couple. <laughs> so, but most of my books do have a heterosexual couple at the center of the, the, the series. Um, and my my uh, hot stuff is mostly gay romances. So it's gay werewolves <laughs> in San Francisco because why not? And, um, and so I was a little nervous whether my reader base would follow me into that arena. Um, and they've been actually really cool about it. It's not as big a sell through as the stuff that I write independently that also is in my existing universe and it's definitely the case that um if i write like a tie-in that is a heterosexual main couple uh it sells better uh but that's also market share so i'm not really sure um about that but definitely more of my readers than i thought would happily followed me um into into sexier into gayer into crazier into modern um in a way that i wasn't entirely sure they would um, and I feel like I'm lucky enough to be one of those authors who seems to have established themselves as a writer for whom I have fans of how I write rather than what I write. Um, and what what that how is, I think, I have a kind of breezy style, uh, very, very comedic, very lighthearted. And I would describe everything I write as a comfort read. Like everybody knows nothing too awful is going to happen. It's never going to get too violent or too gruesome and everything's going to be okay in the end. And I think readers followed me because they knew that I would keep that contract with them. And uh, they didn't really mind if I swore a bit um, and had some graphic sex along the way. <laughs> so It's excellent to discover that like, readers like you the author as opposed like so i'm the, plenty of readers uh only like one series from a given author or like because they're very genre specific and it's great to discover that oh people just like the way i write as long as i write the way i write then pe those people will like it yeah and i'm i'm real test i'm super testing them with my next release which is um which is may because it's a uh comedic sci-fi police procedural that takes place on a space station involving an alien who comes from a race with five different genders. And it's kind of also a gay romance with a human dude. So I'm like, let's Wowzers. just, we, I'm gonna just push, I've already like established myself as, I, I mix genres quite a bit. I, I never fit very comfortably anywhere. And I was like, we're just gonna just go. It, I mean, this story just popped into my head and I was like, whatever, I'll write it. <laughs> I have done that many times. It has yes. not always paid off. I, I was going to say, I don't think this is a pizza dragon situation, but, <laughs> but I could be very, very wrong. I'll let you guys know in uh, June how yeah. that goes. <laughs> now, uh, so I, I want to ask, how do you handle juggling multiple series? Like, like, do you like to do series one at a time or, or what is your re release decision? That's, um, that was a big one for me because I had kind of a huge meltdown relatively early on in my career because I, I'm actually, a, for a traditional author, I'm a pretty fast writer, uh, but I discovered that I, I can't do multiple long-running series at a time. Uh, my, the voice of the main character gets super muddled if it's a carryover character from one book to the next. So, um, yeah, so I was, I was actually under contract and I had to turn around to my traditional publisher and be like, yeah, you can, I can either buy myself back out of this contract or you can wait two years till I finish the series I currently am writing because I just can't do it. Uh, so that was a learning process. Um, so if it's a long running series, and I tend to have kind of huge casts of characters, so it's a lot to keep track of. Um, what I found is I can't do another series but what I can do is one-offs. 
Um, and I can do shorter one-offs. And then I can also do, um, so when I write like the San Andreas Shifters, which is the sexy stuff, um, those are single story arcs within a shared universe. So it's the, it's the romance writer's version of a series, which I actually, I really enjoy reading. So essentially they're standalones, but they're shared characters that will pop up and it's a different person's romance each or different people's romance each time. Um, and for some reason, my brain seems to be fine with that. So I can, I can have one series that I'm kind of working on that's doing all the heavy lifting, that's taking up, you know, the lion's share of my organization. And then I have like little ones that I can seem, I seem to be able to happily pick up and, and drop. And actually going hybrid in, improved my productivity. <clears throat> my question is about your series as well. Back when you said when you were, you were creating new series, when do you make the determination that a new series is needed and or required? So um, I am rather famous for throwing my hands up to the air and uh, yelling once a, a, in a crowded room that you should leave a party when you and your readers are still flipping enjoying it. I hate long running series. I don't read them. I won't pick them up. I think authors tend to fail at the 11th hour. I think there's always a jump the shark situation that goes on with super long running series. And I don't care if they're going to buy it. And I don't care how much money Trad is going to throw at me. I will stop it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really like militant about stopping a series. I don't like the beat that dead horse beat it um, philosophy. So, <laughs> all right. So, so how, how many how many titles should an author give it before they should go? Okay, you know what? The heck with this. Let's start a new series here. We need to try something else. But that's the thing. Is like someone like Jim Butcher keeps going, and people keep buying, and they the books seem to be getting better. And I mean, I, I don't read it because it's too long. Aforementioned, like lack. I, I guess I can't commit. Um, too much of a poly reader. But uh, so like it, it does depend on you. Your like emotional. Uh, and creative uh, loyalty to the worlds. Um, but I, I guess because I do, I have written 22 books in the same universe. It's just not the same series. And I do have lots of characters that kind of pop up between series and I drop and pick back up again. Um, I've always, I guess I, I think it has to do with my background. Um, I was raised with like the Pern books with Anne McCaffrey and, and Mercedes Lackey's Valdemar series and or the dark over stuff. And all of that was kind of almost like a shared world sort of situation. And, or you could jump back in time or forward in time and write different short series. So three books or four books. And that's, um, so I guess I, I'm kind of like wedded to that model uh, emotionally. Uh, so yeah, but I definitely, I end series is, and, and to this day, like the number one cult, like, um, plea I get from fans and readers is, are you going to write more Alexia and Connell, which is the first, you know, the first five book series that I wrote and finished almost a decade ago. And they're still like, want more because readers also fall in love with a specific character and that's all they want. Um, to which my attitude generally is there's fan fiction. That's, that's what that's for. <laughs> um, but I have something new you could try. You never know. You might find a new love. Um, so I, I guess I tend to, to answer your question, how do you know when to end? Uh, one series I've written was a kind of like muddle through it and it ended up being five books because uh, I didn't know I was writing a series when I started. And then my young adult series, I had a very tight, outline and plan for four books and I stuck to it and that's what I wrote and um and then my my more recent one is kind of two couplets it's it's a four book series but it really exists as two and then two and that's just because contract negotiations and stuff um and it and it will stop at four um and that's just because I, I I you know my my characters are like we're done with you messing around with our lives like we're gonna go off and live them without you chronicling it anymore <laughs> so stop it is interesting that fans will even if you think you ended the story like everything's kind of wrapped up i i because i get emails from my first series and they're asking like i want to see their baby you know like what kind of adventures can they have <laughs> being a dad and like, well i don't know it'd probably get in the way of you know yeah. playing evil and <laughs> i just like you said if there could be fan fiction it's just not something i ever envisioned doing and i think you're right if you if you go on you you risk 
you know, like, why not end on a high note instead of just exactly there's that author that keeps writing about that one character. <laughs> yes. My grandmother always said, um, you should leave the table a little hungry. The idea being that no matter how much you're enjoying it, and, and I think you should leave your readers a little hungry, like it's okay if they want more, because um, then you can guide them into your next series or something else. Or um, in my case, I, I'm always recommending books that I come across that I feel like will syncopate with my reader base. And I'll be like, oh, you guys, I just read this thing. Like, I know it's not me, but it's really good. Go read that. So um, the enthusiasm is flattering, uh, but I am a believer in, in, in a finish. I just like, I'm like that way as a reader. Secretly, I'm also one of those readers. I won't pick up a series until it's done by the author. And that's a terrible thing to say because we authors have careers based on people who don't do that. But um, I've had too many authors die on me. I've just never forgiven them for it. And they didn't finish the series. It's unacceptable. <laughs> so <laughs> I have to wait till they're done. <laughs> then I know they won't die. <laughs> right. Or in the... Uh not too distant past, you have a lot of publishers who just were like, well, that's it's not selling well enough for no yeah. third book. Never mind that it was a cliffhanger on book two. Yeah. And I know still too many authors who, if they had something dropped by a publisher, they wouldn't pick it up and independently finish it themselves. They're just not that personality, much to my like chagrin. So yeah, it, it does still happen. Um, and so I, I, I'm just nervous as a reader. I don't want to do that to my to my fans. So on the subject of gay werewolves in San Francisco, <laughs> um, I'm just curious for folks who are out there listening and are starting now, maybe in urban fantasy or one of these really competitive kind of big niches in uh, under sci-fi and fantasy. Do you think maybe it's better to try something smaller like that that still has its own categories it can go into and maybe it's mm. a little easier to stand out and become the big fish in the little category? I do, but I also think um, I am not somebody who's pro right to market. I know that's a model that's super popular right now in the indie world. I, I don't come from that and I have an established base that doesn't expect that from me. So, um, you know, take everything I say with a grain of salt. Um, you know, so if you decide, for example, that what you want to write is shifter, werewolf, contemporary set, small town romances with an mpreg theme, then be aware that what you will end up or can end up with is a bunch of fans who just are after that trope. And they won't remember you as an author. They'll just jump to the next person who publishes within that trope. And they're vor voracious. And you f if you can write one a month, man, you can make a living that way. But the bubble will burst or, or you know, but th what they aren't is particularly loyal. And if you do decide that you want to write something else, then unfortunately, they most likely won't follow you there. Um, that's just the inherent danger in that. So but I do think that if you want to distinguish yourself um, as unique, and if you have a point of view, then you should absolutely put that into your book to distinguish yourself without question. Um, I mean, my, like I said, my ballywick is humor and comfort. Um, and that then becomes the thing that people follow me from series to series in order to pursue. And I feel like if you want to be a long-term career author and avoid kind of burnout and that sort of stuff, um, you're better off trying to move your, um, your brand and yourself as a writer in the direction of cultivating a loyal reader base of you, not just, not just the niche that you're writing in. I do think it's possible to build a brand as just maybe an umbrella sci-fi and fantasy author and succeed. It may just take a little longer <laughs> to get there than if you were very specifically, I'm always doing military sci-fi. and Yes, that's who absolutely. I am. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I, I, speaking to like the writers in the audience who are also readers, which I hope most of you are, there are definitely authors out there that uh, as a reader, I only read the one like I love them I think they're great authors but I really only gravitate them when they're doing something like military sci-fi for example uh I'm a huge fan of Tanya Huff and she writes a uh, lots of different ver different um sci-fi fantasy worlds but I really just love her valor series I just love her her hardcore military sci-fi I don't even though I read fantasy for some reason her voice in fantasy just doesn't do it for me I know people who are fans of everything she writes as well um so that is always going to happen like I I have 
dyed in the wool fans who will not follow me into YA. And I like will turn around and be like, you know, I use YA tropes, tricks, and and uh, like a chassis to write almost everything I write because I, I love YA so much because I like how snappy it is. Uh, like if you read, you know, the Solo series, you were reading a series of YAs just bumped up a bit. Uh, like just why is just a marketing term, but some people are just married to like, I'm not gonna, I'm not, I know some readers are just not going to follow you one direction or another. And, and you had to cut those loose and build up a big enough face that will follow you, I suppose. But you're right. The umbrella thing is interesting because I have made this sort of hardcore push to transition into romance. Um, and all of my loyal fans seem to have come out of sci-fi fantasy and they'll happily follow me into romance, but I am struggling to, I, I feel like, I'm not sure, but I feel like I'm struggling to pick up actual romance readers. Um, and maybe I'm not tropey enough for them or I'm not giving them exactly what they want. Um, and still managing to satisfy my base. So I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, you, no matter what you do as a writer, you're going to get pigeonholed by your readers in some way or another. Um, and that, and that is this kind of unwritten contract that I feel like authors talk about, um, that ties to reader betrayal in that, you know, like if they, they pick up a Gail Carragher book and they're expecting one thing. And if they don't get that one thing, they're going to be mad at me. <laughs> um, so um, I have to try to figure out what the one thing is that they expect. As, as a reader, I still remember like 1990 something, David Eddings, Epic <laughs> Fantasy, all over the place, wrote something called The Loser. And I don't know what it was, but it was like, it was a baseball book or something. I don't remember, but I felt, I was like, what is this? What are you I doing to me? <laughs> David Edding's book, because it's fantasy and there's fantasy in all of them. <laughs> well, like Mercedes Lackey, who's a, who's a YA leaning uh, high fantasy author, wrote, uh, I think it's, no, it's Anne McCaffrey. It's, it's worse. It's Anne McCaffrey wrote The Lady. I think it's Anne McCaffrey, which is uh, just like a contemporary Highland romance. And, uh, and, and her publisher just like decided to bring it out and not give her a pen name or anything. And I did the same thing. I picked it up and I was like, what is this? Where's the magic? Where are the dragons? What's going on? You know? Yeah, I'll never forget it. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of the pen name, is, this is pretty recent that you uh, started this new series. Is there anything you've learned so far that uh, you'll use going forward? Ooh, well, um, I have learned that no matter how many tricks you put into it to try and tell people you're making a shift, you're still going to get angry <laughs> emails from people. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, no, but like, I still got one, I only got one, but I did get one who, who basically was like, I know you told us there would be a lot of swearing and sex in these books, but I didn't realize there would be this much swearing and sex in the book. And I was like, oh, I did my best. Like I put a naked male torso on the cover. It's got different, completely different style cover art, like a different pen name. I did everything. It's in the blurb. It's in the back cover copy. It's everywhere. Um, yes, but I still, still people are like, no, it's a Gail Carragher book. Oh. <laughs> you know, it's going to be parasols and tea. No, no, you, you get no, the email not. where they're, they're like, they sound like your mom. They're like, I'm so disappointed in you. You don't need to use all this swearing. <laughs> and I'm like, literally, there's a joke about prostate ones on the back cover copy. <laughs> like, could I have made it any clearer? Yeah. You know, it's some people just want the, the they want to believe that it's just going to be what I want. All the yeah. other ones were what I want. And yeah, <laughs> it's just covering her bases. But uh, so obviously a lot of authors uh, like to keep their pen name secret. Clearly that's not the case this time. Uh, under what circumstances do you think that keeping a pen name secret is the better choice? So I would say um, definitely if you feel like you're going to go up again against what Lindsay and I were just talking about with this like sense of reader betrayal. So if you're substantially shifting genres in a major way, like um, I mean, <laughs> Like Ian Banks and Ian M. Banks, like like if you're going gonna go super literary, I mean, but most it, it kind of depends because I feel like in his case, hard sci-fi has a literary bent often, and so his fans were kind of willing. And in my case, like my stuff did have 
it had lighter sex in it, but it did have sex in it, and it and it was it was kind of lean. So like you know, like they married okay to each other to have this sort of. But if 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 you feel like there's a chance that you're going to encounter that like hardcore reader betrayal, and if you don't have a huge fan base that are super loyal to you and your style, then it might be worth having a couple of different pen names. It's just a lot of work to maintain them and, you know, like have different newsletters and all that kind of thing. But, um, and there is one way to test that, which is hopefully you've been listening to this podcast and others long enough to have like a beta reader team or a super fan um, group in place. You can just pick a couple of them and send them the book. And if they're like lukewarm about it or, or kind of pissed off and, you know, ask them to be really honest with you, then, you know, you, you probably need to rebrand for that, that new venture. That would be my advice. Anyway. Okay. Okay, that kind of ties into my question. It's a fairly easy one. Now that you created a pen name, is there anything other authors should know before they create a pen name of their own? Tips, tricks, words of caution? <laughs> I would say um, at least learn how to subdivide your newsletter. So I uh, have thrown my hand up in the air and just been like, everybody gets the same newsletter. It's only once a month and I can't be bothered. But I do feel like um, I just started, and this is a good sign, but I have just started to get people signing up to my newsletter saying, I only want the San Andreas stuff. I don't want to hear about your previous, I don't want to hear about the steampunk stuff. I only want the, the sexy werewolf. And I'm like, and I do not have a vehicle in place for that. I don't, I don't subdivide. Um, and part of that is uh, one of my tools when I send out my newsletter is at the very bottom of the newsletter. It says, is this not what you wanted? You can follow me on Amazon or BookBub and you, all you will get is new releases. So I don't, I don't offer my list the option of just getting release announcements, which I know a lot of authors do. Um, but I, I do, but that, that tactic relies on BookBub and Amazon to be my middleman. And you know, that's, uh, I, I am a big fan of owning your eyeballs. So I, I think if I had it to do differently, I would learn how to subdivide my letter, newsletter, which I don't know how to do. Um, and so I, I would allow for the flexibility of sending out um, just release notifications and also just release notifications for whichever um, line or series or pen name you want to follow. Um, so that I would definitely, that would be my biggest piece of advice is, is make sure your newsletter chops are ready to handle it. Um, because for me, at least, that's that's where most of my sales and most of my marketing efforts are spent. I'm a, I'm a big proponent of the newsletter. I actually did do a different new news, totally different newsletter for my pen name, and then I've got Sci-Fi has its own newsletter, and then kind of my original fantasy one. And I don't regret that, but um, I and I actually I think I would do it that way again. But it is like you realize you haven't emailed one list in six months because you haven't had a new release in that genre. So. It's always yeah. more work if you're going to Exactly. It yeah, exactly. And that was, I mean, I, did, I didn't know about the option. I, I listened to you guys. So I, I heard you talk about it, Lindsay. And I was like, it just seems like so much work to do that. Um, and I already spend, like, I spend a good day, a whole day just on my newsletter to make sure it's as good as it can possibly be because it is such an important, like, messenger for me. Um, and so I was just like, look, you get what, if you sign up for it, you get it. <laughs> like, like, that's going to be like all, I, that's as far as I can go. Um, and if I lose subscribers because of it, then I lose subscribers because of it. But I, I I'm pretty like, I don't have a huge list, but the, my number, like I have a, about 10,000, only 10,000 people on my list, but I have a 62% open rate and you know, something like a 30% click through. Like it's insane. So like they are very, they remain very loyal readers. And part of that is my newsletter is also very kind of light rate and chatty. And I always try and put in something funny, something fun and a joke, you know, like they're still getting what they want from me when they're reading me. Um, so that's kind of, um, that's, that's the contract is like, look, you guys, I put a lot of effort into this. Um, um, and if it's really not what you want, then, uh, then you can just follow me elsewhere and you'll get my new release info that way. 
And that does seem like a way to, even if you're like writing about a release that isn't for a certain person or they don't think it's for them, but you know, like I, I do the sci-fi, I do the fantasy and some people only care about one or the other, but everybody wants to know how the training of my puppy is going. Exactly. So, you know, <laughs> I throw that in there. Here's a picture of Willow guys. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Everybody wants to know what my, I have a cat that's quite a character and gets up to nonsense and everybody wants to know what she did recently. And I also have a little section where I will um, I've like what made me happy and sometimes it's a recipe and sometimes it's a movie series I rewatch, um, you know, so it, there's always something, even if it's not the actual series you want. Um, I'm hoping that I'm still giving you some value. And then I also, because I am out of trad, I have just tons of books and tons of backstock. And if you want um, swag or any of that kind of thing you either have to see me in person or you have to belong to my newsletter it's the only way I give anything away um, and it's like signed hardcover editions and stuff like that so like I just <laughs> sent my poor assistant off with 15 hardcovers to mail off around the world so um, but you only the newsletter gets that too so I do try and, and give them lots of value for for me taking over their inbox <laughs> Well, that seems like a good strategy. I mean, you always want to be not just the deliverer of this certain series, you know, uh, yes. a person they want to hear from. Oh, yeah, my and, dog and <laughs> exactly. And like, I, I do have, like, I do have this weird sci-fi coming out and I don't know which fan base is going to like that. Like, it's got a lot of romance in it. So is that, is the, the romance people going to want it? Or it's got a lot of sci-fi in it. So are the sci-fi fantasy readers going to want it? Because uh, I know I have a, a pickup out of science fiction in my steampunk universe. So what would I do with something like that? Like, the, unfortunately, I don't have to choose. I'm just <laughs> sending it to everyone. And they're like, yep, new weird book. What do you think? <laughs> uh, that, that sounds good. And I'll be interested in checking that one out, too. I have no problem <laughs> with five sexes or genders or whatever the correct term is for that. It sounds fun. <laughs> it is fun. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I was just watching uh, Orville. I finally started watching that, and there's the guy that hatches yeah. eggs. So. Yes, I love that. Oh, I'm, I'm ridiculous. I love that. He's purple, too. I, I just, uh, or the lavender, like, don't, he's, he's lavender. Um, but, yeah, I, I just, this is the fun part, right? Like, when you get to the point where I'm, I'm not as anxious as I used to be about my livelihood, I can just be like, I got a hole in my schedule. Let's throw this book at the wall and see if it sticks. That's good. And um, so we kind of talked a lot about the marketing last time. It was episode 123, if folks want to go check that one out. So I, I guess I know we did your newsletter and, and you're, you're doing quite a bit of good things that people should check out. They should go spy on you. <laughs> um, but is there anything in the last couple of years you've tried that was uh, new and interesting and worked well for you? Well, I'm wide, so that's another way in which I think I differ from a lot. I've, I've never been in KU, um, and that's because I came into being self-published out of trad, and I was already wide, and I have um, a relatively big audience in other parts of the world and out of Barnes & Noble and Kobo and places like that, and so I would get a lot of angry emails if I weren't to continue to be wide. So, And I kind of, half of what I do is is with an effort to avoid angry emails <laughs> from offended readers. I'm like, please don't be mad at me. Um, so I have been uh, experimenting a lot recently with the Kobo promotions option. Um, I, I'm not sure how successful that is. I definitely see, a, I get a, like two or three times the normal uh, downloads and reads uh, for the 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 promotion run, but because of how discounted it is, my bottom line is not, is about the same. Um, but the rumor is with Kobo promotions in particular that you need to keep doing them faithfully for a really long time to start like grabbing a bigger and bigger readership in that market so, and getting your your um, kind of your name out there and stuff. So I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep that up for for a while. Um, it's pretty easy once you have the Kobo promotions tab just bop over once a month and check and see what's what's on offer and like I said since I am wide and I'm in every territory I can pretty much like do whichever um, I'm allowed to do because of genre restrictions and stuff um, and the great thing about Kobo promotions often not always but often is it's a discount code at checkout so your front pricing price point doesn't change so Amazon doesn't price match um, and then they also do a kind of um, deals newsletter thing as well that they will send out which of course that uh, also has no um, 
public facing visibility for Amazon to price match. So as long as you pick the right promotion, that's also helpful. And Kobo has taken to saying in the promotion, this one will not be price matched. So that you can, they know, you know what people are looking for. Um, so that's, uh, that's been, I would say modestly successful. We'll see. Well, I'm interested in whether the market share for that. Um, I'm, I'm very uh, nervous about diversifying. So I left traditional publishing because I didn't want to be entirely reliant on them for my income. Um, and now I'm trying to get away from Amazon because I don't want to be entirely reliant on them for my income. <laughs> so, um, so I'm always doing that kind of experimenting. And uh, like I said, I feel also sort of like I have the fan base and I have the bandwidth to do that sort of experimenting with less risk than people who are more dependent on the income than I am. So um, that is one of the blessings of being trad is like, I know I have a, most of the time, I know I have a traditional publishing contract. I know I'm going to get my advance and I'm going to get my, you know, um, royalty check and stuff like that. So I can be a little experimental with my indie stuff. Let's see what else have I been doing? I do a lot of audio. Um, I, I, make quite a bit in audiobooks now um, and I'm about to again experiment with going over to like find away voices um, and try to go wide on audio for the first time but I haven't, I haven't done that yet what have I done in the past year I did a big um, one of the things I do is survey my readership a lot because I have a very active and enthusiastic fan base so I did a big uh, survey on discoverability with them like how did they find me where did they find me was it an Amazon offer or was it you know in a bookstore. Um, because I've been doing this 10 years, a lot of my original reader base did find me like, like borders and places like that. But a surprisingly enormous number found me via the libraries. And, um, and these are my super fans. These are fans that are in my group and engaged and want to take a, sur a random survey from an author, right? And so I want more of those. Uh, and so I, I've turned my eagle eye on um, libraries recently and trying to get my indie work more into libraries as much as possible. Um, so one of the great secrets for that, for everybody out there, is um, librarians really only order books if they're requested. So uh, you need to activate your fans to go to libraries and or go on Overdrive or go on Libby or go on Baker and Taylor and request your books. And if enough people do that, that's when they get ordered into libraries. So that's my yeah, no, that's awesome. And it's, it's a good idea to survey people too. I've, I've only done informally by asking on Facebook, but I did a couple of times like, where did you, I don't remember what I asked, but kind of like that, where did you find my books? And I actually had, um, we had KM Shea on the show before and her sister, who is her assistant, don't get lost with it now. <laughs> she kind of took, like, actually, I was just curious in reading the answers, but she took all the results and an amazing number of people found me through a book bub through yeah. one app. I've been with them you know, submitting to them every month since the beginning. But I, I thought that was, it was interesting in that how many of those people you think are just bargain seekers that only get the free and the 99 cent stuff have gone on to read everything by me. And so be loyal, it, yeah. If that, you that's... can get them or other sale price folks doesn't mean that they won't buy your whole series. Yeah, I'm a, I, I'm, I... <laughs> This is unhelpful for most authors, but I come out of the scientific community, and so I freaking just love data, and I love pie charts, and I love uh, statistical regression analysis, and like stuff like that, stuff that most people would just go, most authors go bonkers about, and I, I love it so much. But similarly, one of the things that surprised me, because I've had Kindle Daily Deals, I've had a couple of book bubs, I've had a lot of stuff over, and what shocked me was how few of my loyal readership had either come out of that or come out of, um, you know, various Amazon marketing efforts um, and stuff. And maybe that's because I'm not KU, uh, but it does, does seem that, that either I need to turn my attention more thoughtfully into those arenas or it's just not where my particular base is, is going to come from. Um, so yeah, the other thing is uh, how, I'm a reader of blogs and I have like carefully selected blog who I consider my taste curators. Um, and so they recommend books and I'll go buy them. Uh, but it turns out very, very, very few of my super fans uh, found me via any kind of blogger or uh, book recommendation or book reviewer or Goodreads or anything like that. So also interesting.
Yeah. You know, it's funny talking about how, you know, you love data and how nobody, nobody informed the aspiring author that it turns out being really good at processing and collecting data would be super useful. <laughs> and then it turns out to be the superpower that gets you through the rough times. It's so much fun. I'm sorry. I just, I find it so exciting and entertaining. I'm like, oh, look at the chart. Oh, look at that chart. I've got two Excel documents open right now. <laughs> uh, so, so speaking of data and all that, uh, we, are there any marketing techniques that you used to rely upon that you find are becoming less valuable in recent years? Ooh, gosh, what a good question. You guys didn't warn me about this one. I'm sure there are. Um, well, I don't book tour anymore. That was That's a big one for me. Anyway, so I used to have for for eight years, I had one, sometimes two major releases from a traditional publisher a year, and they would put me on book tour for a week or two weeks, which is like, you know, seven cities or 10 cities in 10 days. And, um, and then I would hit the New York Times and they would send me home. <laughs> and, uh, and then I had a, uh, the second book in my most recent series come out and they sent me on a brutal two weeker in the middle of the summer, ugh, which is my least least favorite time to travel. And uh, we didn't hit the list. And I was like, can I never do this again? Like, I know I say this every time, but I really genuinely never want to do this again. If it didn't work, can we just assume it's never going to work? Like, it can't just be my presence that does this. Uh, I can't. Um, and so they, I haven't been since. Uh, so that was a big one for me. Uh, I've definitely pivoted my events. I'm a uh, I am a frequent traveler and I do do a lot of events, but I've been way more strategic about which events I choose. Um, like I won't say yes to anybody who asks me anymore. I will, I'm more likely to shell out to go to a larger event like a Comic-Con than I am to take a guest of honor gig at a, you know, very small um, sci-fi convention. So I, I have been, that, that is definitely something I've changed um, a lot marketing wise okay marketing wise my question for you real quick and easy one do you believe that having your series starter as perma free is still a viable marketing strategy okay uh, I am one of those who doesn't think you should give away your stuff for free but it I don't I, I don't know because I'm not a reader of perma free so I got into free for a while I'm so I'm a, for those of you I, I'm a whale reader. So the reason I talk about like relating to readers a lot is because I do, I read um, between 300 and 600 books a year. I'm a very, very, very fast reader and I read a lot. And so um, that's, that's kind of, so I feel like I come from that, the place of being a reader. <laughs> and so, um, although I know I'm an author, so I have a different perspective and I stopped reading free books that weren't book bub. Um, about two years ago because they weren't good. Um, by and large, they were not worth, it was, I would, I'd be more likely to buy a book for 99 cents than um, download a free one because they were always like badly edited and, and I'm an author, so I can't not see that. I know some readers can, are fine with it, but I, I can't not. So, uh, so that was a, a big move for me. So I don't, I don't know. It seems like there are, um, authors with very large running super popular series is with a primer free first that are doing super well. And I'm thinking about like Mark Dawson's Alex Cross or um, I would say it's maybe genre dependent. I'm not sure. Uh, the suspense thriller people seem to be doing really well with it. Some, um, some of the romance genres seem to be doing really well with it, but I mean, if you have a perma-free first, like your wiggle room isn't as good. I mean, I'm more likely to say do two ninety nine and then, you know, keep it there for a while and do some runs on, on BookBub or something. If you can't get a BookBub, do some other like special, special run where you can lower the price to free for a bit. Um, that feels more versatile to me or, or, or do a 99 cents thing. But I don't, I, I honestly don't know because I myself have stopped reading them and therefore I'm, I'm I get ill-equipped to judge. I do not give anything away for free. Um, I don't run a, I wouldn't even bid in for a book club for free. Um, not unless I had like 12 books in that series. And aforementioned, I don't really write that, that long of series. Uh, so it would always be 99 cents is as slow as I would go. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. That was a harder question than you thought it was. <laughs> well, 
Well, and it's okay. Everybody's doing different stuff. And like I've said on the show, I'm always encouraged by how many different paths there are that people can follow and still find success. So many. And I am, I am a, not a good one to try and em- emulate in any way. And I'm, a, I'm well aware of that. <laughs> um, Just get traditionally published first. And exactly. New York Times bestseller. And exactly. They'll do and fine then. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be fine. I will say that the one piece of advice I give to everyone, which is the piece of advice that I wish I had been given from the get-go, is newsletter. Like, I did not do my newsletter for the first like five years of my career, and that's when I was at my most popular, and I was traveling the most. Um, and yeah, like, and if you do do events, take a newsletter sign-up sheet with you, a physical sign-up sheet. Take it with you. Don't do an iPad thing or anything like that. People don't like touching other people's technology. There's a psychosomatic thing that goes on. Like, take a piece of paper and a pen with you to your signing events. And then the super nervous person who doesn't want to talk to you anyway can sign up for their, for your newsletter while you're signing their book for them. Um, yeah, because I do, there is a whole market of readers and we are so enmeshed in social media. We don't realize this, but there's a huge number of readers out there who don't even think about contacting an author on social media. It wouldn't even occur to them, even if it's their favorite author in the universe. And those are the readers that you can get at a convention physically coming up to you and you can get, you can get their, their email that way. But yeah, I, even like just start your newsletter as early as possible is like my biggest piece of advice. Um, Cause that's my biggest regret. And that makes a lot of sense to do it to do it yourself in person when uh, if you're traditionally published and they put the back matter in the book and it's for their newsletter. Yeah. And you're like, well, that doesn't help me. <laughs> yeah, I did get them. Uh, luckily, uh, they put my website on uh, most of my books, but I didn't have a newsletter yet. So, uh, um, and that's the other uh, thing is um, when you're building a website as an author, the website should have a point of view. Um, I come from Silicon Valley, the Silicon Valley area and all my friends are tech heads. So like I think about this sort of stuff more than I should. Um, and so if your website's point of view is get a direct sale for your book because, you know, I have Gumroad on my website and that's where I want people or, or, or get, get them to download my freebie or whatever it is, just make sure that your website isn't a big loud cry of like, I'm an author and here's all the things I do. You want the website to really like steer people in one direction or another. And mine, for example, is like very gently, but firmly steering them to sign up for my newsletter. (laughs) Um, But that's because that's what I want from visitors the most. Uh, So that is another thing when you're building your website initially and stuff, think about what you want people to do when they come to your website, first and foremost. Excellent advice, because as I know, as someone who has not updated her website in like nine years, if you just keep (laughs) adding more little stuff, people will just be confused and email you and ask you questions. Yes, then you're just making more work for yourself out of the long end, because yeah, you end up being like, answering a bazillion emails instead. I actually have a tactic, which is, I collect calling cards from my readers, you know, which is basically an email uh, form thing. And uh, after a certain number of calling cards or questions asked about the same thing over and over and over again, I'll just create a blog post. And then, <laughs> then I have an answer for them. Um, and also when I'm asked that question again, whether it's on Twitter or in Facebook or whatever, I will repost the blog post to all of my social media channels, even if it's from, you know, 10 years ago or something like I initially had a really big problem as a steampunk author with um, trademark infringement in Etsy because a lot of people were making charm bracelets and then branding them with my books and with my characters and I'm like you guys can't do that (laughs) so I have a big blog post that's all about fan fiction fan make which is that and then the latest thing which is fan dub which I didn't know about but apparently is a new sensation sweeping the nation um And, you know, that just came up recently and I was like, here it is. Here's the big long post where I tell you why my feelings about this subject are so complicated. (laughs) Um, So I I find that's the other thing I tend to use my website for often is like frequently asked questions that I'm like, I just don't want to type this out again. So I'm just going to have a permalink. So I should not have ordered that magnet of your book cover off of Etsy or (laughs) no? (laughs) Christmas tree ornaments. That was a big one. Um, well, I mean, the traditional, at least the original book cover is not as much by that. In those cases, I could just be like, here is Hachette and their team of lawyers, because that is not my problem. 
Uh, so with, with the new pen name stuff, I mean, you, it sounds like you announced it to your regular fans. So you did have some uh, people that were going to check it out no matter what. But yeah. is there anything special you did for the launch, knowing you were kind of starting new there? So I'm a pre-order junkie, and I know there's a lot of conversations about this. So again, because I come out of trad, my readers, my readers expect a pre-order. In fact, they're a little shocked when I don't have a pre-order longer than two months. They're like, we expect a six-month pre-order. Like the moment you're talking about it, we should be able to go pre-order it. And I'm like, sorry, I, I can't do that. Um, but I do like a pre-order. And my big reason for pre-order is that it's um, tr completely trackable. So this was my latest thing. I'm sorry, we're going to get numbery again. But um, so you you can like announce it to your BookBook followers or Amazon sends out the follower notification. And if you have a pre-order, you can bop over to it and you can see that spike happen in the pre-order. And that's like the number one, if you have any kind of fan base at all, the number one reason to do a pre-order is Amazon sends out a notification to your followers on Amazon. And they do this, you have to have the pre-order up for at least a month, it seems. And they do this somewhere around the two week mark. Like it's really hard to track precisely, but that is free advertising. Like they literally send a mail out to everybody who follows you within their ecosystem to say you have a new book coming and you can't, like you, you can't buy that. Like you can buy it from BookBub, but their base isn't as big. So um, that is a really good reason to do a pre-order, if you ask me. Um, but part of that is I have a lot of followers on Amazon, and that's the other thing is I also track my followers on BookBub, and I would encourage people to be engaged on BookBub and you know, like go on there and make sure your your author ID is all spiffy, spiffy and everything. Um, because BookBub will show you how many followers you have. And then if you send a pre-order notification via BookBub, you can take a guess at about how many pre-orders you get off of that number of followers. Then you can retro calculate how many Amazon followers you might have because you also see your spike when the Amazon follow notification goes out. I don't know why you would need to know exactly how many Amazon followers you have, but I'm sure it's very useful information um, that they don't, because they don't give it to you. And if they're not telling you, then it's obviously important. Um, so yeah, I'm a big, I, I do do pre-orders a lot. I also, um, I advocate uh, like not talking about a book until I have a CTA. So um, I don't do a cover art reveal until I have a pre-order link. I don't talk, I don't reveal the book blurb until I have a pre-order link. Like, there's no point in me wasting my reader's bandwidth if they can't act on the thing that they're excited about. And that action is to pre-order it as far as I'm concerned. So um, that's another, like I, I am pretty careful with what I would call my, my cache. And so I talk a lot about other things I'm excited about. I, I really follow that 80, 20 rule where I don't show my stuff unless I have it to shill and if I'm gonna waste everybody's time by saying here's a gorgeous new cover I better have a pre-order link in place for that um, so that's another reason that I'm an advocate of pre-orders because it allows me to sort of stack my promotion um, but again I also have the kind of base that, that likes to pre-order so that helps <laughs> yes indeed um, I, this is potentially a quick and easy question but uh, you're non, uh, you're not Amazon exclusive, which is becoming increasingly rare these days. I know. Uh, for people, I am, I'm wide. Uh, and for other people who are potentially looking to go wide or haven't published yet and will soon publish wide, what storefronts do you think give you the most bang for their buck? Like obviously Amazon is probably still going to be number one, but what other storefronts do you find valuable? Well, this has been interesting because, um, Again, numbers chunky. Uh, I have been watching Barnes and Noble sink down. B and M has, has gone down. Um, they're always going to be a little skewed high for me because I, again, I come out of trad, so I do have a lot of print buyers. Um, so, but it has been going. I feel like Kobo for me is coming up as the second, and then Apple is. I don't. It's so hard to to figure out how to work Apple, it's, it's just a nightmare. Um, so I, that's one of the reasons I've kind of turned my attention towards Kobo promotions recently. Um, yeah. And then like, I don't have a lot of faith in like Scribd and the other ones, although I, I know there are some people who have, who have success with it. Um, 
Yeah, I would say Kobo is the place to turn turn your attention, um, unless you are also heavily in print, in which case you're probably going to still have to focus on Barnes & Noble for a while longer. Um, and then for me, figuring out libraries and really focusing on them has brought that income stream back up. So for a really long time, so I'm, I mostly use draft to digital to push out to all of my other venues. I, I've only just recently gone direct to Kobo because I wanted to use their promotions. But everybody else is D2D because I loathe BNN's interface and I loathe Apple's interface. And I was like, I'll just let draft to digital deal with it for me. Um, and so I compare my income streams, those, everybody who's not Amazon, and they've been pretty even except for OverDrive until I kind of figured out the whole library hacks and stuff. And now it's come up to equal to the other vendors, um, bottom line sales wise, which I'm, I'm super pleased with. <laughs> um, so I would say that that is, that I'm going to, I at least I'm going to try to cultivate um, libraries as my as my second, that's my third tier, I guess. Um, so we go Kobo and then libraries with Amazon right at the top. But, and then my other thing is I would strongly encourage people starting out now to at least consider um, trying to form a working relationship with somebody like Find Away Voices to try and do audio wide, even if you're not, um, even if you're not wide on Amazon uh, for your digital editions just because I do feel like that that's a kind of still a little old west open market um, and they do seem to be increasing their market share but having not dealt with them yet uh, you have to take that that recommendation with a grain of salt all right I actually had a question for you regarding the big name retailers but you just answered it so I'm going to hand you back over to Lindsay and we can start asking you about your travel podcast Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> Before we jump into that, I have to ask for some clarification there. Uh, library hacks for OverDrive? Would you <laughs> willing to share those with us? Um, it's, uh, I, so um, one of the, the keys is, the key is making, is activating your base to ask them to order it. And the other key is realizing that librarians are more request sensitive than they are price sensitive. So I guess what I am saying is I would urge you to do some research into how to price for the library market because it is not the same as in digital, it's not the same as for the other markets. Um, so yeah, but I'm gonna I'm gonna make you Google it yourself and figure <laughs> it out. <laughs> Lindsay, we we can talk later. <laughs> All right. Well, we did have Christine from Kobo on last year, as far as pricing goes, and she mentioned, yeah, you got to price at least twice as high. And traditional publishers are probably asking like fifty dollars for an ebook. So. Yeah. And they're imposing limits on it too. So uh, it's almost like they're imposing, like it's 50 bucks and you are renting it for six months or something. Like there's some crazy shenanigans going on. <laughs> hmm, I don't know how about how those libraries feel about that, but uh, yeah, I know it's hard for me as a author wanting to give people a good deal, you know, I like it, to put on that, like, I'm going to ask for more money. I'm always like, no, no, $5 is as much as I can possibly ask for any book. <laughs> I don't want to be greedy. But, all right. Well, thank you for uh, that. And we did want to ask you, because I didn't know last time that you had a travel podcast. So we were just yeah. going to wrap up with a couple of questions about, um, you want to tell us a little bit about that? And is it for sure. all, just all <laughs> travelers of the world? Uh, it's for everyone who travels, really. Um, but the two of us who are on the podcast, uh, so it's me and Piper J. Drake, who is a, is a romance author, but she also is a has a day job for which she travels 80% of her time. Um, and then I travel at least once a month for an event, usually two or three times a month. And so the two of us are just like, we could get together over dinner and just talk about all of the hacks we have for traveling. Um, from packing to like, like we have an ongoing argument about whether you should travel with a backpack or not. And um, you know, like which kinds of suitcases, but also like, what are the best credit cards to have, like how you hack the system to get an upgrade, like all that sort of stuff. Um, we're both obsessed with it. So that is what, that, that is what the podcast is. It's not, it's, it's 20 minutes, 20 minutes to a half an hour. So the, the name of the podcast is 20 minute delay. And it's the number 20 and then minute delay. Um, 
and yeah, it's just three short segments where we talk about the travel gadgets that we've tested out and we talk about crazy shenanigans that have happened with travel for us. And then we have a little main talk topic where we'll talk about like the etiquette of reclining your seat on different lengths of flights and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and it's, it's just because we both do it so much and we both love it so much. So. Well, that does sound fun and I'll put a link in the show notes. And um, especially if you're traveling a lot, like, you as an author to sell your books or whatever, you know, it really makes a lot of sense to actually get credit, you know, money back or perks or whatever from your flights. So why not? Yeah, absolutely. And like, no, like, how are you, if you're traveling to a convention where you have a bunch of books you have to pack, like, how are you going to do that? <laughs> you know, like, so we, we have all sorts of, all sorts of tips and tricks. Yeah, it's fun. I saw one of your recent episodes was called Hats on a Plane. Yes. Is that like just... snakes or <laughs> that where you put your hat? Yeah, how to travel with really difficultly shaped objects was that one. Like if you are traveling to a steampunk convention and you have a top hat, like how do you transport it? It does not fit in the overhead compartment on <laughs> the smaller, you know, puddle jumper planes. So yeah, that's, that's what that one's about. <laughs> Um, so one of the things I want to ask is, you know, this is a travel podcast. Uh, do you pod, like, do you record any of these while traveling? Like, do you, do you get together? And, and, and we did actually, there's a really funny recent episode where we both went to RWA nationals and we were both presenting and we were both talking, we were both doing events. And so at the end of the con, we did a podcast episode where we talk about how do you save your voice if you're doing a lot of speaking gigs, uh, you know, on the go and like, how do you keep yourself from getting sick and all that sort of thing. Um, and also kind of what it, how, like the tricks and tips for surviving a convention hotel as a, you know, which are often chain hotels. And yeah, so we do do that. Um, not that often. We were just actually up at a podcasting convention together and we didn't, man, we were having too much fun to drop a podcast, but um, we will often do it together. Um, but honestly, we both travel so much that most of the time it's just, um, just the two of us recording uh, in remote locations. <laughs> Uh, I guess what I sort of want to ask is, uh, uh, like, when you do record on the road, how do you do that? What's your sort of setup? Again, sort of a technical thing. but Ah, here we're getting totally technical. So we don't use Zencaster or Zoom or anything like that. Um, we both, we do a synced clap, and then we both do independent recording um, lo on localized machines, so we have really clean audio. And then we have a... Um, an audio guy or an audio person who syncs the two back up again in order to give us our, but that's because we, we don't often have guests. Um, we did, we have tried a couple of guests and we're still trying to figure out the best, um, cleanest audio for that. But, um, but yeah, mostly we, we record independent tracks. So if with talking about podcasts, if an author is looking to get his or her name out there, should they consider creating their own podcast? I mean, do you think anyone can do it? Um, I do think the market's kind of flooded right now. There are a lot of writing and author based podcasts out there. Um, and I feel like established ones like this one, you know, have a rocking fan base because they they know about it, but the script, the, discoverability issue with podcasts is about a bazillion times worse than it is just for being an author, just for your book. Um, so I don't know that it's necessarily the best avenue. Um, the, you know, the heyday of, of I mean, I, I have some friends out of podcasting who podcast their fiction, you know, way back, you know, like Scott Sigler back in the back in the early days. Um, and they definitely like launched their career and managed to use that as a platform. Um, but I'm just, I'm not sure if that works anymore. I mean, um, I feel like, especially with the recent acquisition of um, Gimlet Media by Spotify, you know, like podcasts are being noticed. Um, they're being franchised. They're, you know, it's not, it's not quite what it used to be. Um, so I don't know. I, I mean, I specifically do my podcast just for fun. Uh, we almost never talk about our books, and we are assuming that the people who listen to our, our podcast are not necessarily our readers. But I would urge you, if you are thinking about podcast and you think it's something that you would really enjoy and would really do well as part of your, 
as part of a book promo thing to do something that is tangential to your book. So like, like, like this or, um, yeah, but I mean, how many readers do you think you guys like reader fans? Did you guys get off of this podcast? I, I would hazard that, that most of your listeners are fellow authors, not necessarily prospective readers. Um, and so if you're, if you're doing a podcast specifically to try and sell books, then it has to tie very intimately to the book or the brand that you want to sell, which is why it works way better for nonfiction. Right. And I, I've even, I think I told you, I've, or I've told authors before when they've come on the show and they're like, let me, let me get this around and I launch my new book. And I'm like, well, probably not going to move the dial unless you have nonfiction for authors. Exactly. I mean, I've certainly had people who have told me that they checked out one of my books because of the show. Uh, Cause we do have sci-fi fantasy authors who are readers. So it's not a huge stretch, but yeah, I, I've, I used to do affiliate links on the show notes and I'd see, you know, like, Oh, we sold six copies of how to plot your book and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Whereas, uh, you know, the gay shifter vampires and, uh, no. werewolf. <laughs> I, I can't promise you. I mean, maybe somebody will check it out, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, obviously if you're interested out there and you want to like, please go by my website and check out whatever you want. But, um, yeah, that's not, that's not why I do, pod, I do podcasts because I'm a loud mouth and because I feel like I have lots of stuff that I want to share because I'm a data monkey, you know, so that's why I like to come on writer podcasts. Also, it's distinctly not my brand to teach really at all. Um, I really, I am on social media, even Twitter to talk to my readers. I'm on Facebook to interface with my readers. I don't, I almost never like tweet or talk about the publishing industry itself, but I am a voracious consumer of it. I listen to a ton of like, of writing industry podcasts and I read a lot of like the digital reader. Like I read a lot of blogs about it. Um, so I am like, really excited to talk about it <laughs> with any other authors who will let me, um, which is one of the reasons I joined my RWA <laughs> chapter. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, people who will talk about the business of writing because I get so excited about it. Um, but it's not part of my brand. So that's the reason I do podcasts most of the time is just to have a chance to talk with another author for a change. <laughs> well, and that's the best way to do it. Cause if you're a guest, you don't have to do any of the work or do the hosting or anything. Exactly. Like I think about that with my podcast. Sometimes I'm like, wait, Wait, why are we doing this again? <laughs> oh, all right. Well, we're in it now. <laughs> all right. Well, last question for me, kind of on the travel beat or topic. Um, you mentioned that you kind of said no more book tours. Uh, for those who are self-published, maybe, and they, they're maybe they're kind of the mid list, they've got some success. Uh, is it worth it to start traveling or even if they're just starting out to do some maybe local conventions if they're inclined to uh, be extroverted and <laughs> yeah. a little social. Yeah, I would say definitely know your know thyself, right? Um, if you if you are someone who can be charming or can perform, like I perform extrovert very well, I like to say. Like I'm really borderline. I, I'm, I consider myself an introvert, but I can do it. Um, then like, then yeah, I think you might want to consider it. And the reason is more to have more contacts of other authors because it is your conventions for me at least are my water cooler um you know like i can sidle up to another author and i can't do this over the internet i can't do it in writing but i can sidle up to another author at the bar and be like how's that you know non-compete clause going for you when your grand central contract because hashat's you know like raising me over the rails or whatever it is um and that's really the only time i can do that kind of conversation but that's also like um I'll give you another good example. Um, and this again, it, it's more, it's more if you want to break into trad, but like I was standing around talking with my agent at RWA nationals and she has a, one of her co-agents with her. And I see a friend of mine who I think would be a really good fit. I don't do this very often because I, I'm, I, you know, I, really I'm into a personality match with my agency. It's a very specific kind of agency, but I think she's a really good fit. And she happened to have just been in an event where she was collecting a stack of awards. So it couldn't have been more perfect. So she's walking across the parquet carrying a stack of awards she just won. And I was like, 
come over here and meet my agent. And like my agent doesn't rep romance, but guess what? Her, you know, her associate agent right here reps romance and you two should have a conversation because I know she's looking to acquire your kind of book and you're walking around carrying awards. So mm, good sign, right? Um, and that's the kind of thing that happens at conventions. So if you feel like it's something you could do, then yeah, I would say choose it very carefully. And that really is going to depend on what kind of thing you write. Um, you know, so like smaller sci-fi conventions, there's more of an opportunity to really get to know and have converse with whoever their like bigger name guest of author is. But that author better be someone who's like tangential to what you write, you know, if you're, if you, you know, just want to get on their radar for any reason. Um, whereas if you want a real green room activity where you're going to like talk to a bunch of different authors and really get to know people, then, you know, it's probably a comic con or something like that. That's going to be better for you. So it kind of depends on, um, you know, where you are in your career, what you're looking for. And that's the other thing, like having a point of view for your website, I feel like you should have a goal if you're going to go to an event, if you're going to outlay that much money and you're going to go to that effort, you know, and, and I feel like I was listening to an influencer podcast recently and the guy was going to a business con, but he basically said, my goal was I wanted to talk to these five people and that was it. I just wanted to introduce myself. I wanted to say hi. I wanted to say, hey, I love your podcast or I really like your books or whatever it is. Um, and I will consider it a good convention if I've managed to do that. And I am a, a real big fan of, of having smart goals and, um, and knowing what will make, if you're going to go to an event, knowing what will make it successful from your perspective. And keep those goals smart as an SMART, you know, measurable and specific and something that you, you is achievable. <laughs> um, and then I think you can, you can actually have a really good and successful convention. But... Um, but it's complicated, <laughs> yeah. really dependent on you. Now, uh, as you're saying, like, um, but authors at a certain level are going to be guests of honor at this sort of things. Uh, uh, not a lot of authors are at that certain level. I, I was asked to be a guest of honor exactly once and the convention folded before it, it happened. <laughs> so uh, most of us are going to end up being an attendee. So yeah. can you still get value out of a convention if you're not necessarily going to end up in a green room and bumping el you know, rubbing, rubbing elbows with your uh, associates? Again, it depends on your goal, but it, I do think it will, it will be harder. Um, but there are definitely, I mean, there are definitely authors like me milling around who I will, you know, who someone will come up and like be decent, normal human being and seem nice and like is a fan of my books and is like, I'm a new writer and, you know, can I, can I buy you a coffee and pick your brain? And I'll be like, yeah, I don't have a panel for, you know, an hour. Like, sure, I will hang out with you. And that's the kind of value you can get from it is just like picking some, you know, that, that sort of thing. And some conventions are getting pretty good at um, author advocacy in terms of like the panels that are offered and stuff. And there can't, you know, and there, you can get some value out of that as well. But again, uh, pick and choose your con well. This is where um, being part of writer forums and like having some online contacts with fellow authors can help because you can be like, hey, I'm thinking about going to X. Anybody in this group been to this event? Like, is it worth my time? Da, 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 da. Um, it, yeah, again, it's going to depend on what stage you are in your career. Um, but one of the... <laughs> This is the, one of the reasons to go to a convention, at least of some kind, um, especially if you're a sci-fi fantasy author, is to see how other authors behave on panels so you know what to do and what not to do and how not to behave. <laughs> um, I, so I come out of the convention world. I was a big fangirl and, you know, I was a cosplayer and I used to go to cons all the time as a teenager. Um, so... I'm already in favor of them as a general rule, but I also always knew I wanted to write. And I always went to the writer, how to be a writer panels, how to do a query letter panels, all those sorts of things. And this, we're talking 20, 30 years ago. And, um, and I always like tried to analyze why I was gravitated towards one person over another, like how they modulate their voice, what they had to say, that kind of thing. Um, because that is a good lesson. Just, in, in general. Um, so I would say at least go to one so you know if they're for you or not, right? <laughs> yep. Jeff, you want to finish us up? 
Yeah, I've got just one question left. I, I just look, reading that my question that I wrote out here, I'm going to change it just a smidge. If an author is planning on uh, attending a convention where they plan on participating, what should be on their checklist of things to do before they attend? For instance, number of books to bring, swag, that sort of thing? I have a blog post for you. Um, you can Google Gail Carragher um, atten um, convention attendance kit. And I actually have a blog post where I have a photograph of the thing that I take to a convention um, because I'm nice. pretty specific. And I, 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 like, I can't pull them all off the top of my head, but my number one is a, a newsletter sign-up sheet. So if you're, if you're going to a con as a guest, which means you're on a panel, you probably have a signing as well. Um, and even if there's only going to be one or two people in your line because you're at the beginning of your career, get get them to sign up for your newsletter, right? Um, I would, I would, so the kit is like physical things. So business cards are a must. I urge you to have a business card that has a matte side and a glossy side and to make sure the matte side has lots of white space on it so people can note down how they met you and who you are. Um, so don't crowd your business card. If you have a book out, the book's cover should be your business card. If, if you've only got the one, that's what you do. Um, you, I don't think you need separate business cards for uh, readers versus industry. I don't think that's necessary. Um, and then, you know, I have multiple different signing pens, you know, uh, so I have essentially this, this one blog post that is, that is the author uh, convention kit. I usually have a resources tab on my website and there's a, a travel section there, which has a whole section just for authors who are traveling, like, um, you know, how to keep yourself healthy when you're shaking all those hands all the time, that, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. And what, what was, what was the other thing I was going to say? Go ahead. No, it's gone. It's gone out of my head. <laughs> I like how you have uh, that's the, uh, okay. It happens to the best of us. <laughs> I like how you refer to to your blog post as you were discussing earlier, creating yes! blog posts for people <laughs> to ask questions. Um, I will get the link to that and post it in the show notes. So oh, oh, I, I remembered. <laughs> I remembered. If you are an author who has series, I would also urge you to sometimes they will liaise you with whoever the book vendor is who might be selling your books. So if you're guest of honor, there should be absolutely you shouldn't be taking a guest of honor gig if there isn't someone else there selling your books. You shouldn't be selling your own. Someone else should be doing it. Um, if you're guest of honor and they're flying you out and paying for everything. Um, but I would urge you to liaise with whoever that vendor is and you can legitimately just ask the convention who it is um, and encourage them to carry the first book of your series, mostly if not only, because generally speaking, your activities as a panelist are getting you new readers and that's why you do it. And those new readers want to buy the first book in your series. They're not interested in the latter one or the most recent one. Um, and because any super fan who's going to, or any fan in general who's at that convention who's going to come find you, they probably already have your most recent book unless it's like launching that day. Um, so that is one of my tips that's not in any of my blog posts or anything. But yeah, if you're a series author and you have a series, make sure that the vending room is carrying the first book in your series. All right, I'm gonna have to check out that blog post because I'm the one that shows up and I'm like, why did why would I have a business card? I'm just here to hang out. I'm not trying to sell <laughs> any books. <laughs> Although I'm going to the the ones I usually go to are not the reader ones. You know, it's more other authors. I've gone to a bunch of the indie <laughs> self publishing stuff, but yeah, they all have cards, and I'm of like, of course, but you like it's the easiest thing. Ago. You don't you don't have to write down. <laughs> you don't have to write down anybody's email address, right? You just like hand them your card and you're like, send me an email and we'll figure it out. Whatever it is. You're like, I w let's interview sometime here. Have my card. Right? Drop That's me line. why I have this show. <laughs> we can have people on who do it right and not do what I do. Just in my cave and write books. <laughs> I don't know. It seems to be working for you. So well, there's nothing wrong with sitting in your cave and writing books. If uh, you can write enough of them. <laughs> But yeah, no, I, uh, we appreciate having you on a second time as a guest. Oh, thanks for having me, you guys. It's been great. And lots of great nuggets hey, today. Hey, thanks for all the info. Oh, my pleasure. Anytime, anytime. And uh, remind us uh, the travel podcast and your site on where people can find you and stalk you and such. <laughs> sure. Um, my travel podcast is called 20 Minute Delay, and you can find that wherever you source your travel and it's the number 20 and then the word minute and the word delay. Um, 
And you can probably find it by searching Gail Carriger as well, I suspect. Um, and that is how you can find me everywhere. So I am a social media junkie and I am on social media. But like I said, uh, I do not give advice for authors very often over social media. So uh, don't bother to sign up for my newsletter or follow me on social media unless you're interested in seeing how I do it for my reader base, um, in which case you should feel free and imitate the heck out of me. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, you just search Gail, and that's the A-I-L, the British spelling, G-A-I-L, um, Carragher. Uh, and yeah, I, one of the many things I have worked very hard to do is own my SEO. So you just search my name and whatever platform you'd like to interface with me on, or whatever blog or topic you're interested in, and uh, it should pop up with above the fold. <laughs> That's good. I feel fortunate to have a name that's not very common because nobody can either spell first name or last name, but if they get close enough, especially Google is really good. You know, yeah. that, I often go to Google to like look up words I can't spell that it's, I'm mangling it so badly that autocorrect couldn't even help me. They're like, yeah. oh, we don't know what this word is either. <laughs> Google always yeah. knows. Did you mean? Yes, I did. <laughs> that is that is one of those things if you're thinking about pen names, not to loop it back to the beginning of our conversation, but yeah, Google that, Chiz, before you decide on that pen name because you sure don't want to be fighting with someone else who, who owns it uh, who owns it more than you ever could. Right. Um, yeah. Also Google character names so you don't name them after fish in the German language. <laughs> Just to, I think that's happen. adorable. It's the best <laughs> thing ever. All right. Well, on that note, we better wrap it up. Thank you so much for staying in uh, well over an hour to talk to us. And uh, thank you for listening, everyone. Bye, everybody. You guys, I'll take it easy. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>